You all know conservation of energy? Yes. Energy can neither be destroyed and nor be created. <laughs> but all energy came from nowhere. Big Bang, it came from nowhere. That is fine, okay. That's a miracle. All science is built on one unscientific thing. That is okay. But then even, in, even conserve, conservation of energy, some scientists are questioning it because they found many places where this is not, especially in quantum mechanics and all, there are cases of violating that. Meaning energy coming from nowhere, unaccounted for. In this respect, in the 18th, 19th century, where when the conservation of energy was being treated like the most universal law, <coughs> this materialist attitude started coming. Everything they started treating as machines. Everything is machine, everything is pattern of energy. You give this much energy, it will come out. So they started treating all living systems also as energy, just energy input output. So there were a group of people in the West also, they were called as vitalists. In English, in yoga we say prana, the same thing in Western philosophy was vital energy, vitalism. So some people were backing the idea that in living organisms there is something different, there is something extra that, that makes them alive. It is not just energy, not just this energy which you see. There is an extra ingredient which makes them alive. So they were promoting that idea and materialists wanted to disprove it. So what they did was, what the materialists did, they experimented on living system to see how much energy is coming, how much energy is going and how much energy is getting stored, whether energy is conserved in your body. And the results matched, how much ever energy you get, how much that is energy, that is what is being propagated now. You should eat two or two thousand calories, they are treating you as machines. All human beings are machines, you should take this much fuel, this much output you can give. That's what is happening. So the results matched, in 1920s they did that, on human beings and animals. And they, over many weeks, they monitored the body, heat loss and all forms of energy input, all forms of energy output they calculated, measured. And it gave a very good match, 99.5% match. After that, after that happened, everybody thought that this vitalist theory is no more. We have explained the living system. We have explained the living system with, the, with respect to energy and there is no need to suppose an extra ingredient like vital energy. In 1980s, however, a man took that project again and he looked at all the data of that 1920s experiment and he saw there were so many discrepancies. The experiment was not done correctly. Then he got curious and then he did that experiment, he repeated it. This time it was 1980s, the measurements were more sophisticated, more accurate, there were more machines to do that. So he did it on some animals and some human beings. And he found that 27% of the energy was unaccounted for. It is not in the food that you ate, but it is giving output. 27% of the energy that a living human being, he was talking of human beings. 27% of the energy that a normal human being is giving out was not at all taken in, meaning if you, if you in, if your intake was 1000 calories, your output was 1270 calories. From where did that extra energy come? But then everybody suppressed this fact, everybody said that this experiment is flawed. This, actually the experiment for, was flawed in the 1920s, but the funny thing with science is, Whenever experimental data matches with theory, even if experiment is flawed, they will say, oh no, this is matching, matching. Okay, fine, it was fine. But if it does not match with your expectation, then you'll simply brush aside saying that the experiment is flawed. And everybody has suppressed it. Now just look at the implications of this. What does it mean? You are a normal human being. They did it on normal people like us. 
27 percent of your energy is coming you are manufacturing it on your own from some, somewhere you are doing it you are tapping the source that is what you call as prana in yoga what we call as prana is that and from 27 percent can't you increase it if you make it 100 percent you are independent of food after that you are tapping your own source of energy See, just if they say in during Big Bang all energy came from nowhere, then what is the guarantee that that source has no... There must be more energy in that source. What is the guarantee? It is not there. There may be. You may be tapping that source. So your level of evolution, I am speaking in terms of Hatha Yoga language now. In Hatha Yoga language, your evolution, your level of evolution is measured with respect to this how, how much of percent of percentage of energy you are tapping on your own that is why prana and pranayama is given utmost importance in hatha yoga in patanjali yoga sutra also they say that if you take prana into your control that's all everything is in your control you are independent you have become master of energy tesla used to speak in the, have you heard of the name tesla he is the one who, he is an energy scientist. He, his speciality is that, energy, he was an energy scientist and he was trying to tap all sources of energy and make it available. His dream was free energy. That's what, that was what his dream was. He was saying there is a free source of energy, it's just that we don't know how to tap it. And apparently living organisms are already tapping it. If you make it conscious, you can tap more. Maybe uh, plants are tapping less than you, you are tapping more or plants are tapping more than you, I don't know. So if you increase that 27% more and more, the process of yoga is that. If you do pranayama, that the hatha yoga techniques are that. When you practice hatha yoga techniques, your body starts becoming an energy battery, it can generate its self-generation. Not generation from nowhere, there must be a source. But you will tap that source. What's the reference for the study? You can read the book Science Delusion. In that book there is a reference for that. Rupert Sheldrake. Rupert Sheldrake. There is a TED talk given by him and they banned it. They banned it precisely for that purpose. Because it was against what majority of scientists are saying. It is going against that. Book name is Science Delusion. Because he wrote that book because there is a person called Richard Dawkins. He wrote a book called God Delusion. So in response to that he wrote this book, Science Delusion. And he gave proper answers for everything. He showed how flawed science is currently. Meaning science is no more science now. Science means what? There has to be a spirit of enquiry. There should be an open-mindedness. If you find something peculiar, you should be ready to investigate that. Instead of that, today scientists are no more like that. They have decided certain things and if you say no, we have found something different, they will say no, you are, you are flawed. They will throw you out. It's, so, what was happening with religion in the 16th century in Europe is happening with science now. Same thing, same rigidity, same bias is happening with science. Science has become rigid. And our these modern people who think they are very scientific don't know all this. They don't know the downfall of science. <laughs>